So, it's been a while, and we're back. <laughs> so, welcome, everybody, to Season 2, Episode number 62 of the Mastering Marriage Podcast. We got a lot of stuff to cover, so we're going to get going. Let's go. <laughs> Right, so welcome back, everybody. I know you have hey, been hey, asking, hey. you've been wanting, you've been wishing, praying, and hoping that a new episode <laughs> will come out, and it, it's back. And today we have a lot of uh, new information to share with you in regards to just what's been going on with us. Um, so we're going to get to that in a minute, but before we do, I just want to say welcome to everybody who... Uh, has never heard of us before. My name is David Taylor. I'm with my lovely co-host, my wife, hey, Amanda. Amanda Taylor. I was kind of setting it up for her to say her name, but I guess she didn't see me. So, yeah, I'm David. <laughs> That's Amanda. We're back in the booth. And, um, yes, thank you guys for tuning in. It's been a while. It's been a few months. Mm-hmm. Um, we have some good excuses and some not-so-good excuses as to why it's been so long. But at the end of the day, um We're going to share with you what's been going on with the tailors, with us, and then also what's been going on with the business. And then we have a large, like, information-packed episode to jump into. So, uh, anything you want to just say to the people before we get started, baby? Uh, We've missed you all. (laughs) Yes, we have. uh, You know, being in the booth and, you know, being on the podcast, it's always fun to, you know, do these shows, do these lives. And so, we're just glad to be back. Good. Yes, we are. And... Speaking of being back, uh, we're back, but we're a little larger than <laughs> normal. Uh, there's a new addition to the family, y'all. Mandy is pregnant. I am. She's pregnant. She's five months pregnant. I am. And we're pregnant with a baby girl. <laughs> Yay. And so in February of 2018, for those of you who haven't heard on Facebook yet, uh, we're going to be bringing in a new addition to the family for the first time, finally, yes. uh, it took it took us five years, and, and finally we got it right. We found yes. the right combination. But <laughs> Zaya Joy Taylor is on the way. So yeah, I just wanted to you know share with you guys that you know baby Zaya is coming, and um, so y'all just be praying for us. Thank you for those who have been praying for yes, us. Yes, thank but you. Mandy's so much. pregnant. It's going down. Um, and speaking of pregnancy, uh. We have decided to birth something new with our business. And you might have found this out on Facebook as well or on the email list if you are a subscriber. But we have actually changed. We literally have rebranded our website and our business name. Um, We used to be Mend Our Marriage, but we have shifted to calling the business Mastering Marriage. Kind of similar to the podcast, Mastering Marriage podcast. Business is Mastering Marriage. Yes. And the reason why we shifted, because, you know, by the way, some people didn't like the name change. Some people, we actually kind of lost maybe four or 500 followers on Facebook because of the name change, which is okay. Um, But we shifted because we're, as our business has been growing, we've been expanding to working, not just with hurting marriages, but with marriages in general. Right. And so, the title or name Mastering Marriage um, is more so focused on helping you to master the key components of what a healthy marriage has to have in order to survive and thrive. Mm-hmm. And so it's not just about helping hurting marriages, but it's about helping marriages in general, educating, empowerment, right. uplifting, um, and being there to support. And so we decided to change it to Mastering Marriage. We have a lot of new things on the way. Um, we have MMU or Mastering Marriage University coming very, yes. very soon. Mm-hmm. Um, be on the lookout for that. We got two new books about to drop, my book and Mandy's book. I mean, there's a lot of new things that we got. We're going to be expanding our reach on Facebook, doing more Facebook Lives. Um, so we figured Mastering Marriage was more appropriate than Mend Our Marriage because right. uh, we found that some people that find us on Facebook get turned off by the Mend Our Marriage title because they may not be looking to mend their marriage they just be maybe looking to enhance yeah and strengthen their marriage and strengthen exactly a lot of so, people who are going through routine in their marriage are exactly. just stuck in routine yep. so we believe that this title will be more um inclusive and in, exactly i like that word inclusive because we don't want to leave anybody out and here's the thing we completely redid our website 
So if you go to mendourmarriage.com or if you go to masteringourmarriage.com, you'll see the same website. Um, one just redirects to the new one. Um, but we've completely updated the website. Now it's for two types of individuals. Right. So if you, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. So if you go to our <laughs> website, you can go down two different paths. One path will take you down the path, uh, down the road of if you're for those who need help in their hurting marriages. Right. So they can choose on that link and it'll direct them to the resources for those who need help with their hurting marriages. And then the other path is for those who, who want to go looking, from good to great. Yeah. They want to take their marriage from being good to great. And those resources will help you in that vein. So check it out. Go to mastering our marriage.com. If you would like to learn about the new website, also with our email newsletter list, um, for those of you who are on it, we've given you the op- op- opportunity, couldn't get that word out, <laughs> to unsubscribe from our regular email list and subscribe to the new list, which is for those who need help with hurting marriages. We've divided up the list. That way we can give two different types of resources to two different types of individuals. Yes. So. That's be done. more specific. Yes, exactly. So now that we've talked about the rebranding and I can go into more detail, but you guys ain't listening for that. You want to hear about how to, um, the, the things that every marriage should be built upon. Right. So um, we're going <laughs> to talk about that. One quick thing. I want to give a shout out to our Patreon, our top Patreon sponsor of the month. Her name is Tremika Murph. And we just want to say Tremika. thank you. We thank appreciate you. you. We love you for supporting the show. This show and future shows happen because of our Patreon sponsors. Mm -hmm. So if you are uh, looking to be a Patreon sponsor, uh, we'll show you how to do that at the end of the show. But we just wanted to give a shout out to Trey Maker because she's off the hook. And this show is dedicated to you. Shout out to you, girl. Shout out to you. So, okay. So, Mandy, um, I need you to put your, your thinking cap on. Because it's we on. it's on okay good because because you're pregnant so I'm not saying that pregnant people don't have thinking caps <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm but just there saying is a, a very real thing <laughs> called pregnancy brain yeah so I just want to make sure and then I be getting pregnancy brain too sometime y'all oh, so pray Lord. for me um, but today's show is going to be really 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 heavy um, it's a lot of information so I want to prep you guys and say go ahead and get your notebooks out your pen. Your pads, some water. Um, get you some water. <laughs> I got me some right here because my throat might get a little hot. Um, it's but sticky. <laughs> it's sticky. Dang. Okay. Well, it might. You never know. <laughs> I'm prepared though. But anyway, guys, we want to go ahead and jump right in because I know this is a lot of information, yeah. and some of it may challenge you, some of it may stretch you. But uh, today we're going to talk about the pillars of marriage, and specifically ten pillars of marriage, and these are the things that every Literally every marriage should be built upon. Um, and then in the end, I want to kind of get, let you guys evaluate based off of those pillars. How strong is your marriage? Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to discuss a topic related to marriage that often goes overlooked. And here's the thing. After years of working with marriages and studying marriages, um, it has dawned on me that most people getting married, they really don't have a clue as to what they're doing. Right. They get married with hopes and aspirations and expectations, but they don't have any skill set that complements their desire to be married. Right. And so they get married and they they just don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Um, Actually, a huge percentage of those individuals are merely going through marriage, implementing bad habits that were either passed down to them from their parents, if their parents were married, or they enter into marriage, implementing bad habits from what they think marriage should actually look and feel like. And as a result, they leave their marriage vulnerable to the many illnesses that lead to divorce. And actually, those illnesses lead to the divorce rate being over 50% for first-time marriages, Mm -hmm. which is still just ridiculous. And then, like, 65% for second-time marriages and 75% for third-time marriages. So people don't get smarter as they marry more. You know, it actually gets worse. I heard it this way, and, and this is not a good thing, by the way, but someone said if... You got, if, if before you got on an airplane, somebody told you that there's a 50% chance of this airplane crashing, would you get on? Nobody would get on the airplane. Right. Right. And so that's the, that's the scary part is that we see less and less people getting married now because it's that same concept. Well, there's a 50% chance that this thing is going to crash and burn right. this marriage. So why would I even do it? Right. And it's because 
We just aren't equipped. We just don't know. We lack knowledge. The Bible says my people are destroyed. Why, baby? For lack of knowledge. For lack of knowledge. Exactly. And so today we're going to spend some time focusing on the foundation of marriage, which most people completely overlook. More specifically, we're going to be discussing the 10 things that every marriage should be built upon. And we're calling those 10 things the 10 pillars of marriage. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get started with these pillars, I would like to share with you who this information is for. Now, because because you may be thinking, well, I know this stuff or maybe I don't need this stuff. So let me let me qualify those who are listening. OK, this content will be valuable for those who are getting married, those who have recently gotten married and for those who have been married for quite some time. Mm-hmm. Now, if you are getting married, if you're engaged or you're thinking about marriage, hopefully you're listening to this, by the way. It would be in your best interest to make sure that you set your marriage up for success by ensuring that the exact pillars that are needed to support the weight of your marriage is in place. That way, when the stormy seasons of marriage come, and guess what? They and most definitely they, Them jokers don't come. <laughs> when them stormy seasons come, you and your marriage is adequately prepared to endure. The same is the case for those who have recently gotten married. Now, as your marriage is maturing, Adding these key ingredients into the mix will help ensure that as it does continue to grow, it will do so with the addition of things that will only set your marriage up for success three, five, and 10 years from now. And lastly, even if you've been married for, let's say, seven or any seven years or longer, this information is especially for you, right? Just because you've been married longer don't mean you're smarter, okay? Just saying. I know a lot of people that have been driving for years and they still don't know how to drive, but we're not going to get on that right now. We're just not going to go there. But anyway, this information is especially for you if you've been married for a long time. Here's the reason why. Far too often, I come across couples who have been married for years, but whose foundation is so faulty that it compromises the structural integrity of their marriage. So when the storm comes, because they always do, their marriage suffers. And these couples tend to be caught up in the unhealthy cycles and due to life, bills, kids, and other things, they don't have the time and the energy to even fix their marriages. So they, so they ride the storm out and they wait for the next one to come, right? And this information will help you to go back to the basics, to reevaluate what is missing so that you can begin to properly tend to the pillars that need your attention the most. Because you may be doing good in two or three of these pillars. And so you don't need to focus on all 10. Just focus on the ones that need the most attention. So by now, (laughs) we've qualified every married person that should be listening. Right? So let's dive into this and discuss the 10 pillars that every marriage should be built upon. Then we will challenge you to objectively assess how strong your marriage currently is in each of those 10 areas. Okay? Good. Are we good so far? Ready to dive in, baby? You you just you, you, the cat got your tongue. Yeah, I'm ready. Why you? <laughs> I was inviting you to speak, and you just kept nodding your head. I'm sorry, I had that a that. little uh, something going on in the baby. Area, oh, so what I'm happened? To... You want to share with the people what you're feeling? Oh, she was moving, and I got I felt a little nausea. Oh, 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 Zay, so it was calm all right. down, Zay. Go no, to... she's all right. You know what? Before we get started, guys, I do want to share something with you guys because y'all family. <laughs> I, I had two dreams about my baby girl before I even yes, knew did. that we were having a girl. God <laughs> literally showed me her twice. I got to hold her. I got to play with her. I got to yeah. smile and kiss on her. I, I got a chance to meet her twice before we even saw her at the ultrasound so that's just something that i'll always cherish for life but anyway um let's get (laughs) back to the (laughs) let's get back to the 10 pillars of marriage and go ahead i'm I'm gonna go ahead and start with the first pillar uh that your marriage should be built upon and these are in no particular order so you can look at them and you know evaluate them as you you know choose to so but anyway the first pillar is spiritual synergy Now, when I say spiritual synergy, I'm speaking about the combined efforts of you and your spouse interacting spiritually, so much so that the combined effort of you guys uh, working together spiritually is so, so much greater that it produces an effect that is greater than what you can do if you guys were to work 
on your own spiritually. And spiritual synergy is all about spiritual intimacy. Spiritual intimacy is the connection that is created between a, between a couple when they uh, share their spiritual growth with each other. Now, keep in mind that spiritual intimacy is not the same as spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is what you do on your own. It's personal. But spiritual intimacy comes from your ability to share with your sp- with your spouse your spiritual growth. And if you don't, if you, you might remember the phrase spiritual intimacy from an episode that we did where we discussed the six areas of intimacy, uh, but spiritual intimacy is one of the six areas of intimacy. And so spiritual synergy is created through spiritual intimacy. Right. And so, you know, like, think about it like this. What is God's purpose for your marriage? And are you two actively pursuing his purpose for your marriage and living it out? Because a newsflash, people, uh, God has a purpose for your marriage. Not to, not to sound like a preacher or a prophet or anything like that. True? But God does have a purpose for your marriage. And he has right. a purpose for you two uh, being in union, being in covenant. Right. And often people get married just because they want to like experience what marriage has to offer, but they completely misappropriate the purpose of their marriage. And because they don't know the purpose of their marriage, they never live up to the purpose of their marriage. And because of that, spiritual synergy suffers. Spiritual synergy will always impact the lives around you, by the way, not just your marriage. So think about that as you're looking to uh, assess how strong you are in this area. Spiritual synergy. That's one pillar. Let's move to the next because we got 10 to cover. The next one, and this should be a no-brainer, but for some reason, people come to my office still, like, confused about this one. But another pillar, which is probably the most important pillar, is unconditional love. Um, When I refer to unconditional love inside of a marriage, this is how we define it. So I'm not just thinking about the emotion of love and the other types of love, like philea, storge, eros. I'm talking about agape. And unconditional love means... To give all that I have all all the time. time. Yes. And that's a very complex, deep type of love. Because it's not about me. It's completely about me giving all that I have all the time to someone else. Mm -hmm. That's hard to do on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. And that's why we see a lot of people suffer in this pillar, with this pillar. Because it's just unconditional love means I can't be about myself. I can't be selfish. I have to be selfless. Kind of like you were, baby, when you stood for the marriage. You were modeling unconditional love, and that was something, that was a tone that you set in the marriage. Right. And I thank you for that. I pre I honor you for that. Thank you. you. (laughs) Um, But yeah, unconditional love means to give all that I have all the time. And and so what this means is that unconditional love is not an emotion. So you you should never be saying, I just don't feel like I, I don't feel in love with you anymore. Like that, that should, those words shouldn't, if if it ever comes out your mouth, just go ahead and just shut your lips because that shouldn't come out your mouth. If you understand, if you truly understand the nature of love, see unconditional love produces emotions, but it's not an emotion, right? Attraction can shift. Attraction can definitely shift. It can shift up and down throughout the course of the lifetime of your marriage, but that has nothing to do with choosing to love. Yes. Because attraction is not love. Right. And a lot of people, especially when they get married and especially before marriage, they misappropriate attraction for love right. and these butterfly feelings. But really, love, unconditional love is a choice. It's a decision that you intentionally make exactly. every single day of your life. It's a behavior that's purposeful, right? right? There has to be an intention and a goal regarding unconditional love. Mm-hmm. Uh, unconditional love means that at all times, you are intentionally deciding to give all that you have to your spouse to take it a step further. Cause I like to take it a step further. <laughs> you are doing so knowing that your spouse may not return the favor. Now, how many of you guys can actually say that I'm willing to embark in this unconditional love journey, meaning I'm loving you regardless of what you return back to me. And a lot of people will probably frown up at that because mm. that's not how they view marriage. Right? Yes. View marriage as a 50-50. Yeah. And and we'll get to that because it's not 50-50. Like, see, with unconditional love, you're truly laying down your life for a friend. That's right. With loving your spouse unconditionally, you're choosing to enter into a one-sided contract. I don't like 
like that. That's scary, right? You're, they don't like that. This is, <laughs> they don't like it, baby? They don't like that. <laughs> They're, you're entering into a one-sided contract. Like, think of it this way. And Mandy, Mandy just said it. Unconditional love inside of your marriage is not 50-50, right? It's not even 100-100. Unconditional love inside of your marriage is 100-0. That's scary. It's 100-0. That means that you are not doing things with the expectation that you will get things in return. 100-0 means that you give no matter what you get. You give because you choose to give, period. That's what unconditional love is. So then people are going to ask, well, then why get married? They, you think about it. Like the most, like, okay, the Bible says this way. There's greater no, greater love no man has than to lay his life down for a friend. Like marriage is about sacrifice. And here's the other part. And I, I write about this in my book, my new book that I write, that, that I write about. I write, and I write, this is going down. I love it. But anyway, like marriage is about becoming the highest version of yourself that you can possibly be mm-hmm. so that you can leave a lasting imprint in the world. See, marriage is about influence. And I talk about this in the book. I talk about this uh, even later here. But it's about becoming better so that you can give more, mm-hmm. right? And so, like, it, it, it's, I don't want to go too deep in that because I got other pillars. Yeah, but that's yeah. a really good question. Let's move to the next pillar. Um, but at the end of the day, unconditional love is about giving all that you have all the time. And that's I'm sure we'll have some courses in the MMU. Ooh. Oh, Mastery Marriage University. Ooh, that's a plug. Unconditional love. Absolutely. The whole concept of 100 zero. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to teach that. That's yeah. a plug. Yeah. Um, y'all see, see, y'all be on the lookout for this type of stuff. Cause I'm, I'm telling y'all when it it's comes coming. to mastering marriage, we're not here just to entertain you guys. Yeah. Uh, we're here to educate and empower your marriage. And because if you really want more and yeah. if you allow yourself not to get offended by the content, like, you know, and you know, defend yourself and defend your stance. Mm-hmm. And you really want to learn more about this 100 zero concept, then MMU will definitely be for you. She just plugging away, y'all. Look at that. Go on, get it, baby. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> but you're absolutely resource. correct. MMU is going to be off the hook. Um, so let's go to the next pillar. The next pillar, and, and this is one of my favorites. I like talking about it. It's safety and security. Mm-hmm. So See, important. Safety and security is vital to the human experience. We often thrive in environments where we feel the most safe, Mm -hmm. right? Your your marriage is one of those environments where safety and security matters the most. Mm -hmm. And safety and security is so crucial to the livelihood of your marriage that incorporating this into your marriage almost always guarantees marital success, whereas not including this inside of your marriage does the complete opposite. And... Over the last 14 years of working with individuals and working with couples, I see this is a common theme. If they come into the marriage and they come into my sessions and they feel completely unsafe with their spouse, not in the sense that like he's going to beat me up or anything, but emotionally unsafe. I can't be vulnerable. I can't share myself. I can't be who I really am. Mm -hmm. Those are the marriages that struggle the most. Yeah. On the flip side, if you come in and you feel completely comfortable and you guys are uh, make the other partner feel safe and secure expressing themselves and being vulnerable. That's when I see the most growth happen. So it's so, so, so crucial. Yes. S- see, your spouse will naturally become vulnerable based on how safe and secure they feel inside the marriage. Mm-hmm. Right. And to go even further, your ability to cultivate a climate of safety and security will directly affect their ability to become vulnerable with you. And, I say this formula all the time, but you want your spouse to be vulnerable on all fronts, right? With, so that intimacy can be created. So safety and security produces uh, vulnerability. Vulnerability produces intimacy. Intimacy is all about connection, right? right? The more intimacy is inside of your marriage, the more influence you have with your spouse. So safety and security produces vulnerability. Vulnerability produces intimacy. Intimacy produces influence. And guess what, guys? Marriage is all about influence. Exactly. And like I just said, God desires for your spouse to influence you into becoming a better version of yourself so that you can have a greater impact on the world. And in your marriage. And in your marriage. Absolutely. So safety and security is another pillar. So let's go to the next pillar. This is pillar number four. 
emotional intelligence. And we did a whole episode on this. Um, this concept was covered much, much deeper in episode number 58. So go back and listen to that if you um, need to. But I'll give you a brief overview of this whole concept of emotional intelligence. I just did a speech on this. Um, I went and did a, a speaking engagement on this, and it was so fun. Yeah, you um, did great. Thank you, baby. <laughs> but emotional intelligence, or EQ, is one of the most overlooked skills of human development. Like, we literally don't even teach emotional intelligence. It, like, in school, even in college, very rarely, I, I don't, I have never seen a course on emotional intelligence. No. It, it's something that we're expected to simply learn on your own through life's experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and that sucks. See, because ironically, uh, this is one skill that like this one skill of emotional intelligence is one of the most important skills to have if you want to be successful in marriage. Mm -hmm. Like in order for you to be successful as a spouse, you have to have a high EQ. Mm -hmm. it, 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 there's no negotiating that. Mm -hmm. Right. And, but we don't learn it. Nobody's teaching it. There's books, though. You got to find it. But in school, developing, you, you just don't. There's no emotional intelligence one on one, right. which it should be. But anyway, let me keep going. If See, if you lack having a high emotional intelligence, you will struggle severely when it comes to interacting on a deep level with your spouse. And yes, us dudes, us men, us ashy guys, <laughs> we usually have a lower EQ than women. Like, because it's just not socially acceptable for men to be connected with their emotions, their deeper emotions. Uh, women, it's okay for y'all to be, right? Like, when the baby comes, it's it's okay for you to be, you know, the baby to be swaddled up with you. But for dudes, we have this ego where we got to be tough, right? And so, you but know, you won't have I, 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 I sure won't. I'm going to be hugged up all on my daughter because that's mm -hmm. my baby girl. But anyway, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, but so let me let me define what emotional intelligence is, because I just did all this talking about it and I didn't define it. Um, so emotional intelligence or EQ is defined as your ability to recognize and understand emotions inside of yourself and inside of others, as well as your ability to use that awareness to manage your behaviors and to manage your relationships. So like emotional intelligence, it's all about knowing yourself, being aware of how you feel, what's going on internally, and then being able to apply what you're going, what's going on internally to your behaviors externally, as well as your relationships. See, emotional intelligence affects how we manage behavior. It affects how we navigate complex social situations like mm -hmm. marriage, yeah. and it affects how we make personal decisions. Right. So if it affects pretty much everything. And as I discussed in episode number 58, there are four areas that you must develop in order to increase your EQ. And I'm just going to briefly run through these because, again, go listen to episode 58. It'll give you even more details. But the four areas of EQ is self-awareness. And self-awareness is your ability to perceive your own emotions in the moment and to understand how your tendencies are across different situations. Mm -hmm. So what's going on in inside of me? And then how am I in different social situations? Mm -hmm. What are my triggers? Who triggers me? When am I triggered the most? Right. right? How do I act when I'm triggered? Mm -hmm. Self-management, which is the second area of emotional intelligence. This means that you are effectively and successfully able to manage your reactions to both situations and people. Mm -hmm. Right? This one is all about not being controlled by right. your emotions. Yeah. This is huge, y'all. Self-management is something that a lot of people lack. This means that you can control how you feel, and what you do. The third area of emotional intelligence is social awareness. And the social awareness is your ability to accurately pick up on emotions in other people and to understand what's really going on with them, right? So how well are you at understanding when your spouse is upset? How well, how well, how well do you do at reading your spouse's body language, their facial expressions, right? That's social awareness. Yeah. And then the last one is relationship management. That's the last area of EQ. And relationship management is your ability to use your awareness of your own emotions and the emotions of your spouse to manage your marriage successfully. Right. So this is about making sure that you can use your awareness, the awareness of what's going on in your spouse to manage and navigate through your marriage. Okay. Again, listen to episode number 58 if you want more details on that, because we got more pillars to cover. So let's move to the next pillar. The next one is intimacy. Yes. Intimacy inside of your marriage 
is deeper than just yeah, sex. Say, it's okay? Not just sex. It's not just Y'all coitus. Okay? It's not coitus. It is coitus, but it ain't just coitus. Okay? Nasty. Anyway, so <laughs> sex and marriage is not nasty, by the way. I just like saying that. I don't know why. Intimacy is all about connection, exposure, and influence. Because mm-hmm. remember, intimacy precedes influence. So the more intimate you guys are, the more influence you guys will have with each other. Right. Intimacy is about connection, exposure, and influence. Actually, like I said earlier, there are six areas of intimacy as it relates to marriage. And I cover these six areas or more in depth in episode number 47. Okay. But I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the six areas of intimacy, just in case y'all ain't listened to episode number 47, which you should have, because it's a very important one. But here are the six areas of intimacy. The first one is emotional intimacy. And this one is all about how well do you share, accept, and respect the other emotions or the emotions of your spouse? Are you afraid to truly give your emotions, your true emotions to your partner? Do you feel that you will be penalized if you open up and talk about how you truly feel? Mm -hmm. I know that I've in the past, and if I'm not paying attention, I could struggle with this particular one because I know that there are moments when Mandy want to express something to me, especially during pregnancy. She may feel that I may be critical or tell her that that emotion doesn't matter. And so these, especially for men, because we just aren't trained in emotional intelligence and being emotionally intimate, like, this is one that you got to look out for the most, fellas, okay? Um, the, ex, the next area of emotional, or I'm sorry, the next area of intimacy is intellectual intimacy. And this one is all about how free are you with sharing your thoughts with each other? Or how much do you feel included in their world? How much do they feel included in your world? Like, do you guys just have random conversations about round, random things that come to your mind? And are you guys growing intellectually together? And this is not just about being smart, Okay. This is about opening opening up the deep recesses of your world, your thought life, and being comfortable exposing that to your spouse. Right. Third area of intimacy is, you guessed it, sexual intimacy. Mm-hmm. This one is all about how free are you to express your sexual energy, uh, how sexually connected are you to. And sexual intimacy is not just about the act of coitus. It's about the flirting, the physical contact, the connection that you guys have prior to sex the attraction that you share, the attraction that you maintain, right? Uh, one of the laws that I write about in my new book, which I'll talk about at a later time, is about uh, leaving no room for competition. So are you stimulating sexual energy energy inside of your marriage? Are you walking around with your breath smelling, right? Is that something that your spouse has told you about and you just haven't fixed yet, right? Are you? What about body odor? Fellas, are you maintaining a healthy body image? Don't let yourself go. You were doing push-ups before you met her, but now all of a sudden you got a beer belly and you 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 okay with that, thinking that you're still strong, you you still sexy. No, don't leave no room for competition. Jump in that shower. Yeah, you. jump in that shower. Use wipe wipes. yourself. Use some wet wipes if you go do number two. No, let's be real, <laughs> no, right? If you go if you go take a deuce, you know if you if you ain't gonna clean yourself, use some wet wipes or something. Okay, don't just use tissue. It's dry. And, but off of the shower later. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, let's move forward. But this is all about stimulating sexual energy. And we're being yeah. raw and, and r- real with you guys, okay? Um, the next area of intimacy is spiritual intimacy. And this is different than, and I talked about this earlier, right? Because this is one of the, spiritual synergy is one of the pillars mm-hmm. of marriage. So you guys already heard me talk about spiritual intimacy. Remember, I said it's not, a, it, spiritual intimacy is different than spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is what you do on your own. Spiritual intimacy comes from your ability to share with your spouse your spiritual growth. Is this happening inside of your marriage? What what time do you guys spend not just praying and reading the Bible, but growing and talking about your relationship with God, your understanding with God, your perception of God? This has to be something that you guys are doing together. Again, it's one of the pillars. The next area of intimacy is relational intimacy. This is all about the quality of relationships that your marriage have, right? Think of it like this. Your marriage is the average of the five couples that you're the closest to. Who is keeping you guys accountable? And what do you guys look like? Birds of a feather flock together. So hopefully you're surrounding yourself with couples that can take you and your marriage to the next level. Keeping healthy. Accountability. It's all about keeping healthy, right? right? And the last area of intimacy is financial intimacy. What is the financial health of your marriage? Are you guys more in debt this year than you were last year? Are you guys growing financially? Is there trust, right? Um, I work with couples all the time, and they, they say, you know, 
we our biggest area of I- issue is finances. Either because one person is irresponsible or one person just doesn't have the trust. Uh, but financial intimacy is all about the connection that you guys share around the area of finances. So that's the other pillar. That's the pillar of intimacy. Let me move on because, again, I have a lot to cover. So the next pillar that I want to talk about is trust. This is important. This one is a no-brainer as it pertains to relationships, of course. Trust is a key element in how human interactions go, regardless of what stage of life you're in, Mm -hmm. right? So you think about it like this. Based on how things were when you were like a baby and throughout your adolescence, you either learn that this world could be something that you can trust or you learn that you had to find ways to protect and survive on your own. And here's what happens. The, the, the perception in our relationship with trust as children transfers to how things go when we're adults. So we often bring these core beliefs with us about how the world is, how trustworthy the world is, into our marriages. And this is good for us if we have a healthy view of trust, and it's bad for us if we don't. Right. For starters, most people misinterpret how trust should be handled inside of relationships. Mm -hmm. Like, did you know that trust should be viewed as a two-way street where there's a receiver of trust and a giver Mm -hmm. of trust? Mm -hmm. See, trust is not just a one-sided agreement. It's it's a two-sided street. It's a two-way street. And it's all about giving trust and receiving trust. There has to be someone who is trusting, right? And someone who is trustworthy. Right in order for trust to work in a marriage. So if you have one without the other, that almost always provides or proves to be damaging for the marriage and for the person's ability to you last trust inside of the marriage. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to be willing, uh, trusting and also trustworthy. Trust requires both. Okay. That's another pillar. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the next pillar. We're going to, we're just checking these off the box. The next pillar of marriage is effective, Communication skills. This is a doozy because most folk, we just don't know how to communicate effectively. We we can communicate, right? Go on Facebook, you'll see it a lot, but we don't know how to communicate effectively. Uh, People often come to my private practice for marriage counseling due to a lack of this one skill. And if you think about it, communication determines our human experience. See, we are born with the desire to communicate. And we thrive with those who we can communicate the best with. The best marriages house the best communicators. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the worst marriages house individuals who struggle with interpersonal communication skills. Now, to keep things very short and simple, there are three levels of communication. And knowing these three levels will help you become a better communicator. Here are the three levels of communication. The first one is vocabulary. (laughs) <laughs> and this is all about what we say. Now, I, you, you may be surprised, but seven, only 7% of what we communicate is based on vocabulary. So 7%, that's a small percentage. That's yeah. less than 10%. The second area uh, or the second level of communication is voice inflection. And this is how we say what we say. And now, like your, vo- your voice tone, intonation, things like that, this makes up 38% of communication. So 38%, it is, it's crazy that only 7% is what we say. 38% is, is not what we say, but how we say it. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. And the third level of communication with, which is the most important level is nonverbal, right? And this is what we do while we are saying what we say. 55% of communication is made up of nonverbal communication and it would benefit you to pay close attention to your spouse's body language because they could be saying one thing with their mouth and saying something completely different with their body, which is often how things go dealing with the pregnant wife. I'm just, just putting that out there. It's just, I was waiting on you. I was waiting on you. You You say I do that even when I'm not pregnant. Yeah. Mandy has, she, her nonverbals are more telling than her verbal. It's like everybody. It is, it is. But Mandy's not as, she doesn't say much with her mouth, but she says a lot with her body language. And that's what's scary because it's like, she could be like, I'm good. But then I look at her body language and I'm like, this chick ain't good. She closed off. She's staring out the window. Shoot. I made, what did I do? <laughs> what did, what the heck did I do? 
but yeah, nonverbal is 55%. And I could spend an entire podcast focusing on this one topic. That's how important communication is to your marriage. Uh, but for now, for the sake of time, just know that you and your spouse will most likely have two different communication styles and will most likely put more of an emphasis on one of those levels, one of those three levels of communication than the other. What this means is that you may have grown up in a household where what was said was considered more important than how it was said, or your nonverbals was considered more important than anything else. Because of this, you will have to be very careful. Trust me, guys, you're going to have to be very careful not to give your own communication style to your spouse Mm -hmm. and the expectations that come along with that. You should probably say that again. Like you, you, you can't give your communication style to your spouse and you can't give your expectations of how that communication style works to your spouse. Instead, you will have to take the time to understand your spouse's communication style and learn how to speak in a manner that makes them feel the most safe and the most secure. Well, that's going to be a great MMU course. Oh my gosh. Yes. Tell you role playing. Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but this is why uh, effective communication skills are so important to a healthy marriage. And this is why it's one of the pillars. Right. And this is also one of the main areas that people struggle with. So let's move to the next pillar. Moving on. All right. The next pillar is effective conflict resolution skills. So we had effective communication skills. Now we have effective conflict resolution skills. People just don't know how to fight fair. Marriage In marriage, you're going to fight. You're going to have arguments. You're going to have moments of conflict and tension. But most people I found, they just don't know how to fight fair. They start punching below the belt. They start doing all kinds of things, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, But I define conflict simply as this, the tension that is created by two opposing views. That's all it is. So if if I say I want ice cream, Mandy say I want yogurt, that's conflict. (laughs) That don't mean we about to, you know, have a drop down argument, but that's just conflict. It's tension, right? We have two different views, and what do you do with that tension, right? Yeah, we end up getting some yogurt because she's <laughs> pregnant, and you just don't want to go there with the pregnant person. I'm just saying. But you we know wanna... that a lot of conflict can get deep in that. But <laughs> yeah. we're just giving an example. Yeah. See, conflict <laughs> is a natural part of the human experience, and it goes hand in hand with being married. Mm-hmm. Like you can't escape it. For some reason, though, in marriage. Conflict seems to be unwelcome. Like people just like get married and then they're like, we fight and maybe we shouldn't be together. Right. Oh it's my goodness. Like ma- this shouldn't feel this way. We shouldn't have to work. It should be Ooh, easy. I've heard that. I've heard that on TV. I've heard yeah. that. Um, no, sucker. It's people. not that easy. I'm sorry. I got, I, I, let me calm down. It's not, it's, you got to work at this. Like you work at everything that you earn. Marriage is not any different. I know that's right. <laughs> let me calm down. Um, but anyway, Snap. I've witnessed couples literally go days without talking to each other for fear of having a conflict. Mm. And for the record, conflict is neither negative or positive. It's actually neutral. See, conflict becomes negative um, when people see it as such mm. and when they treat it as such, mm-hmm. when they fear it. But it's really a neutral thing. The goal, however, is to see conflict as something that if used correctly, can bring tremendous growth to your marriage. See, conflict is just a tool that you should be using Mm -hmm. to bring growth to your marriage. Mm -hmm. To properly use conflict when it arises, one has to have effective conflict resolution skills. Mm -hmm. Again, a whole episode can be given to this subject, and I know we're going to be doing a lot in the MMU on conflict resolution. Uh, But for now, let me share with you one of the most important things to do when conflict arises. And I talk about this in my new book that I'm writing, the one that I'm writing, my, my new one. I talk about this. This it's, it's is one of the laws of marriage. Right. Yes. Calm down. But here's what you should do <laughs> whenever conflict arises. Avoid the four horsemen to fill relationships. Just avoid them jokers, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And let me just give you those four horsemen, then we're going to move to the next pillar. Again, uh, we had a whole episode could be... Do- you know, given just to this one, we're going to talk about this in MMU. I'm going to talk about this in my new book, the one that I'm writing, my, the one I'm writing, that one. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. But anyway, the four horsemen, <laughs> their criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. Mm-hmm. Them jokers, you got to leave alone. Don't allow in your conflict because they will screw things up 
and they will eventually erode the very foundation of this particular pillar. Yeah. They'll crumble it, okay? So those four horsemen, leave alone. We're going to go even deeper uh, with those things, and we have actually talked about those in past episodes. We actually have a blog. We, we have a blog. Yep, yeah, yeah, we sure do. I don't know the title, or else I would direct it to you, but just go to the website, um, <laughs> masteringourmarriage.com slash blogs, and you'll, you can find it. Anyway, let's go to the next pillar, because... Uh, we have, let's see, one, two, oh, we, we only got two left, and we, we're done. So this is number nine. Uh, the ninth pillar is respect, okay? Put some respect on it. Yes, put some respect. <laughs> <laughs> how, how can you truly submit one to another if there's no respect mm. or respect, okay? How can you truly trust your spouse if there's no respect? How can you truly <laughs> love unconditionally if you don't have respect for your spouse, no, too much. <laughs> I said normally. David David knows <laughs> that it's for the T, not the not a K. You said put some respect on it. No, yeah, it, it was supposed to be a joke. Yeah, I know. For that second, did I draw it out too much? You, you know. Oh, okay, I thought I, I, I enjoyed it. Was cute, it was cute though. I, oh, thank you, baby. But anyway, let's move. <laughs> <laughs> but think about it. How can you truly submit and have unconditional love and trust your spouse if you don't respect them? Mm-hmm. See, this pillar of marriage has to be. It, it has to be in place at all times because without it the decision to love unconditionally becomes that much more harder see unconditional love is already difficult especially if you lack access to the source but if there's no respect involved it's going to be extremely hard to love unconditionally Mm -hmm. and before you see this as a no-brainer understand that it is often your respect for your spouse that leaves first Mm -hmm. you may not know it but it really is see think about it when you first met he appeared to be extremely financially savvy right so you gave him your trust in the area of finances you know he drew he drew he drove up in his new car had his new clothes on was smelling good new shoes freshly lined up right so he's like oh this brother got you know he's talking about how well he's doing managing his business portfolio so he was like this brother could do it so you trusted him financially but the more you got to know him you started to notice that he actually had massive amounts of debt and very poor money management habits. He was renting those cars, but not like renting the car. He was like renting the car for a day, you know, and paying daily to just have this nice. Date. Yeah, just for the day. He was showing off, right? Um, and he was taking out loans to, you know, finance his clothes and his haircut, right? And he didn't have a business. He just had a business idea. Um, but you didn't learn that until you actually got to know him a little better, right? So eventually, as a result of the truth coming out, you lost respect for him in that area. And as a result, the topic of money becomes a major source of conflict between you guys. And you're less likely to submit to him in that area. All because there's no respect. Now, granted, I'm not saying you should respect him because of his financial mismanagement. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying one or the other. I'm just letting you know what happens, typically. See, respect affects your desire to even use effective conflict resolution skills. And it ultimately, like, affects, like, ultimately a lack of respect starts to erode the intimacy that you share. Think about it. No intimacy equals no influence. And marriage is all about influence. So if there's a lack of respect inside of the marriage, trust me, influence is going to go. Yes. So let's go to the last pillar. Then we're going to wrap up, okay? Right. You, you still alive? You still with me? I am. Can I take a swig of water? Sure, go mm-hmm. right ahead. <laughs> oh, that was good. That, that was nice and refreshing. refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> so the last area or the last pillar is integrity. Mm. Yes. Inte- I said it, integrity. See, respect is often influenced by a person's integrity. Mm. Right? Think about with that money management analogy. His financial integrity, or lack thereof, is what caused you to begin to lose respect for his ability to be trusted with money. So it was the integrity that caused you, or his lack of integrity that caused you to lose respect. Integrity is one of the most important of the ten pillars because of this. And because it almost weaves its way through all of the other pillars. I often define integrity as the consistency between who you are in public and who you are when nobody's looking. That's good. 
So what do you look like when you're around your family and friends? What, what do you sound like when you're at church? Praise the Lord. Amen, brother. I'm high, blessed and highly favored. But when you're in a car getting cut off by somebody, you start cursing. That's a lack of integrity. Right. So who are you they in the public? Like no, they're not. But you know what? It's, it, it hits all of us. Like integrity is something that we all have to protect be mindful of. and be yeah. mindful of. Exactly. Yeah. So, but it's the consistency between that, who you are in public and who you are when nobody's looking. Right. Integrity is a character trait that is often learned and is a key component of developing trust, developing respect and developing unconditional love. So just because you were married and you finally got your spouse, that don't mean that you can simply become someone who you weren't while you were fighting so hard to get them. Okay? Remember I talk about leave no room for competition. So if if you appear to be this very um, health conscious person and you were fit, eating healthy when y'all were dating, but now that you're married, you've, you've let yourself go and you've gained weight and you have very poor habits, that's a lack of integrity. And guess what's going to happen? Like when he liked you when you were fit and now you let yourself go. So now all of a sudden he's getting tempted by other women who were, who looked like you were when he first met. Cause that's who he was attracted to. And, and remember attraction and love is two different things. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not confusing the two, but just understand that your integrity can affect attraction. It can. Please take this serious. And and please don't be so naive as to say, Oh, well, if, your attra- <laughs> if your attraction changes, then they need to find somebody else. Well, I want you to go out and get some snagatooth dude from mm, from snag-a-tooth. on the street that's musty, and you say, "Okay, hey, I I love him for who he is on the inside." Yeah, it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. Yeah. So attraction, there there are certain things that we have to do to keep ourselves up to keep our spouses attracted. And you should be wanting to do that because please believe, like. It's difficult to be attracted to one person. Then when they change, what now, now keep in mind, people do change. And so you have to be willing to allow them to change, but I'm not talking about just changing because of life. I'm talking about changing because of poor habits, changing because of a lack of integrity. So I used to work out, but now I'm just being lazy and I'm eating chips all the time. Right. So then now you still expect him to be attracted to that when he wasn't attracted to that to begin with. Exactly. So it's integrity. That's, the 10th pillar of marriage. So there you go, guys. And again, we could spend more time, but we've spent enough. Uh, (laughs) But there you go. The 10 pillars that every marriage should be built upon. Now, what I want you to do is I want to give you guys an assignment. Okay. So we went over the 10 pillars, but I want you guys to go back through these 10 pillars, go back through the episode. If you haven't taken any notes and here's what I want you to do with this information. I want you to rate yourself on each of the 10 pillars. And if you're feeling really froggy, have your spouse rate you, (laughs) jump, have your spouse rate you on each of those 10 pillars. So like if you guys uh, listen to this together, you can, you can rate each other on these 10 pillars and using, now this isn't meant to create an argument. Yeah, this isn't meant to create division. It will create conflict, but it, they don't need to be an argument. This can be an intimate discussion, right? for you to learn and grow. But here's what I want you guys to do using a scale of one to 10 with one being the lowest and 10 being the highest. I want you to answer this one question. How well are you performing in each of these pillars? Start with your lowest rated pillar and begin to intentionally work to increase your performance in that area. Okay. And if you can do that with all 10, you will create an environment where these 10 pillars are supporting your marriage, mm-hmm. right? And this is what it's all about. Right. So, you know, do that. Please let us know how things go. I want to hear some feedback from you guys after you complete the assignment. Uh, but we're going to wrap up here. And I hope that this information helps you. I'm, I'm fully aware that this is not what most people talk about when they talk about marriage enhancement. Mm-hmm. Um, so it may seem new to you, you know, to some of you guys, and that's fine. But again, I challenge you to go back, listen to this as often as needed. And, you know, Mandy alluded to this earlier with, you know, MMU and other resources, but we plan to continue to provide this level of information during this second season of the podcast. You know, we want to make sure that we're standing out, not because of our personalities, but because of the type of uh, information that we're providing. 
Uh, so you can expect this. And so that's why you may only get two a month because these are really information heavy episodes. So we want you not to just listen to it once, but listen to it until you got it and apply right. it. Right. Okay. And I mentioned at the top of uh, this podcast, how you can help to ensure that we continue to do this same thing. And that's through Patreon. Right. Um, and Patreon is a way for you guys to sponsor our episodes uh, so that we can invest the time, the resources, and the energy into making sure that we improve it. Um, and Tremaker, thank you again for being our top sponsor of the mo- yes, of the month through Patreon. Um, but if you're curious about Patreon and how you can help, simply go to this website, www.patreon, and that's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash mastering marriage. So that's patreon.com slash mastering marriage and that's how you can help us out we really will appreciate it uh, we will give you a shout out you also will get this uh, podcast episode in pdf format emailed directly to you um, that way you can follow along with it or take notes easily right. um, and then we, we, we just appreciate it. we'll give you a shout out on the air so um, mm-hmm. also remember that you can leave a comment about this particular episode by going to mastering our marriage.com slash episode 62 mm-hmm. And that way, if you have any questions or you just want to tell us how much we you love us, we can love you back. Um, and anyway, uh, we're going to wrap up here. Lastly, subscribe in iTunes if you haven't done so already. If you haven't, what the heck is wrong with you? Subscribe so that you can get these shows automatically downloaded to your iPhone um, or your your you know iPad or whatever uh, as soon as they come out. Then and also Stitcher Radio. Yep, yeah, s- subscribe to Stitcher, and that way you can get them automatically Android. download to Android. Mm-hmm. We got both of y'all covered. Right. Um, and you can leave an honest rating and review there, and uh, we'll appreciate you guys. Um, because the more ratings and reviews we receive, the the higher we rank, and the higher we rank, the more people have access to these divorce-destroying resources. That's right. Guys, I'm David Taylor. I'm with my beautiful wife, Amanda, Amanda, Amanda. and our baby in her belly. It's going down in a couple months. But we are out, y'all. We appreciate your time. All right. Deuce, 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 baby.